We're going to go ahead and do sort of just a real informal discussion on the probability amplitude typically found in, in quantum mechanics to more or less get into the inner workings of the collapse. So this is sort of forbidden territory, if you will. In quantum mechanics, there's a, a peculiar behavior that subatomic particles exhibit. And one of the most famous examples of this is called the two-slit experiment. What you end up having is a situation where we have either one particle or two particles. And these particles are going to travel and they're going to come to sort of a barrier, if you will, that has slits in it. And this is... And then after they go through the slits, they're detected. And for instance, uh, if we were dealing with, with waves, we'd see like a wave front, and then these waves would come along and, and we would have sort of like a, a, a distribution along this, this final wall, if you will, um, sort of giving us a, 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 you know, a mapping out, if you will, of the, the wave pattern from the wave of a specific frequency going through with this particular slit, blah, blah, blah. Same thing down here, the second one. And waves, you get an interference pattern, and the way that you would detect or monitor the wave motion back here, you could do a mathematics to basically find that some of the energy in the waves was lost due to interference, and there will be peaks and troughs, places where wave energy was amplified, places where it was diminished, basically just interference along there. So this is how waves do it. And when you do an experiment with uh, subatomic particles like electrons or photons, you get this you get this wave phenomena with one particle. I'm sorry, with two particles, and even with one particle. And this is part of the bizarre behavior of quantum mechanics. But what's more interesting is uh, let's say we want to study the wave phenomena of the particles, or the particle, so we do it with one, we close up one of the holes and we come here and we put some kind of a, like a detector here, like this little camera to kind of watch, you see when this particle comes through and when we do it, it comes through and, and is detected or, 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 uh, or leaves an indication of that uh, it moved like a regular old particle. So when we're measuring or observing the motion of subatomic particles, they act like classic particles. Um, if we don't, then it exhibits the wave uh, behavior again. And if we open up the slit, even with one, we still get the interference pattern as though we did it with two. So on and so forth. So this is a really rough general overview of the two-slit experiment. So what we're going to do now is we're going to focus mostly on one particle by itself with virtual particles or actually two particles interacting with each other. And we're more or less going to use this as sort of, a, sort of the same example but both ways. We're not being very technical here. Just trying to give a, an overview of how existics uh, can account for the mechanism of the collapse of the probability amplitude. Okay, so let's go back to, we have our two particles. Let's let particle B have a head start. So particle B is off and running before particle A gets a chance to even go. And we're gonna go ahead and assume that B is moving faster than A. A's, we're at the point where A's just, just starting to go. B's already off and running. B's moving at more or less relativistic speeds, more or less, in relation to A. Now what's interesting is in quantum mechanics, um, we have the change in position times the change in momentum is 
greater than equal to Planck's constant. And this is basically um, part of the uncertainty principle. And let's look at A and B. So we can look at this situation in two different ways. We can look at it in relation to position, or we can look at it in relation to momentum. So, if we look at it in relation to position, so let's go over here, we'll just do delta x <coughs> for position. Clearly, we can see that b is ahead of a. So, we'll just kind of write that like this. b being greater than a, and we're just going to let that more or less symbolize that b is ahead of a. But what's interesting is this. If we think about B and A initially being more or less the same type of particle and B is now moving at a higher rate, and since B is moving at relativistic speeds, we would use a Lorentz transformation to calculate the uh, change from initial mass to the mass it now has. And in doing so, as we applied the, the existing equations to the twin paradox, we would do the same thing to the relativistic mass of B. Point being, the more massive an object, the slower the rate of time, as you know, we discussed previously, as, as us standing here on Earth, time goes by a little bit slower than it would if we were in a near-Earth orbit in a spacecraft. And this has a, been a measured, this is a measurable time variation. So in the same way, B, since B is traveling with greater momentum, B is experiencing a time dilation that A is not. So in a very peculiar way, because of the time dilation associated with, with moving at relativistic speeds and also the time dilation associated with an increase in mass, in a way, in relation to momentum, A is ahead of B in time. So A is ahead of B relative to time, and B is ahead of A relative to position. Now this is extremely interesting. And the reason why is, is relative to the momentum, there's actually sort of like, if you will, another B and another A, whereby A is the one that's ahead of B. So, so basically, relative to position, B is ahead of A, and relative to momentum, A is ahead of B. So, to uh, use some more existence type notation, we'll let this be B relative to A. This is A relative to B. And again, this is in relation to momentum. This is going to be B relative to B. And this is going to be A relative to A. When B relative to B is ahead of A relative to A in relation to position, A relative to B is ahead of B relative to B relative to A in relation to momentum. So. If this is done with just the right change in position and the right change in momentum with just the right amount of uncertainty, and I'm assuming with nobody looking, what we have is a situation that I call an identity crisis. Okay, so what we have is a situation where we cannot tell the difference between A and B. A relative to B more or less is equivalent to B relative to A, and A relative to A is more or less equal to B relative to B, and that also not being the case. So this is more or less what the identity crisis is, and this is why it's a crisis, is we have basically a contradiction. Well, the reason why this is not a contradiction 
is because we're dealing with relative, relative frames of reference. Frame. And so what it basically is, is these, this matches up with this in a way, and this matches up with this in a way, such that the way the identity crisis resolves itself is that they actually change identities with relative versions of themselves. So here's sort of how that would go, is these two particles used to exist in the same frame of reference. But since this one decided to increase its momentum, they are now existing in separate frames of reference of the rate of the passage of the rate of time. However, it's happened in two different ways. One relative to, to the change of position, one relative to the change in momentum. So this thing sort of is like double. Change of position relative to B. B, since B moved first, B is ahead of A. But relative to momentum, because B moved, B is in a slower frame of reference, so relative to time, A is ahead. So if you look, in one sense, this is, this is a step forward in time, and this is actually a retrograde in time, and there's a way which I'm not going to get into right here because this is not this is not a uh, complicated enough treatment of this. But basically, what we're dealing with is an interaction of forward and reverse directions of time superimposed on each other. You cannot tell A from B, right? Are they the same? Are they not the same? So it is the identity crisis that without observing A or B, they can slip into an identity crisis. And here's basically what happens. This is B, and if this is A, and they both have a probability to be at the same place at the same time, which is what we showed over here. So this would be the point of identity crisis at the point of which they are in identity crisis. A and B are the same particle. So at the point of identity crisis, A equals B, as in they, there's no longer two particles, there's one. So, the que so A had the probability to go to here, B had the probability to go here, and only one of these two probabilities is only going to happen. There's a one-quarter probability that A ends up here. There's a one-quarter probability that B ends up here. There's a one-quarter probability that A ends up here. There's a one-quarter probability that B ends up in here. The probability that, that, that in a situation where there's an identity crisis and one or the other possible outcomes occurs, what this means is we have to get rid of at least one of these, doesn't matter which one. So what we're left with is a quarter and a quarter. So there's a half probability. So what that means is, is when there's an identity crisis, we are, only, we're, we are reduced to half the probabilities that there were prior. And what we end up with is that one of these realities happens and one of them does not and the probability is half as to which way it goes. Now the question obviously arises, well where did the other particle go? Where did its energy and mass go? Well it's very simple. It's no longer entangled to one or the other particles. It's gone. There's interference. So what this is doing is showing that it's sort of like, if you will, it's as if, let's call this, this little plane I just drew here, let's call this reality one. And in reality one, particle A is what ends up happening in this. The, the probability for A to occur here is what ends up happening. Well.
this other reality. We have reality two. B here's A. We went the other way. In the other reality, A or B, whichever you want, ended up here. And then, of course, we can do all four possible realities for all the quarter outcomes. And so basically, the question is, where did this particle go? It went here. Well, where did the missing particle here go? It went up here. So what the identity crisis is, is actually, it's like a vector, if you will, whereby the particles are acting orthogonally. So the question is, well, where is this extra orthogonality coming from? Well, it comes from the use of the existence equations in the identity crisis. And so basically what this is, is, is inferring to is, is leaning towards something that will absolutely clarify this and make this a little bit more easy to understand and, and visualize. We're dealing with more than one dimension of time specifically three, and the two dimensions of time have to do with the fact that we have an acceleration occurring here, but what the third dimension of time is that we have two different accelerations, therefore two different passages, two different rates of the passages of time, therefore the third dimension is the rate of, the, of passage of time. So, what we can do now is see that identity crisis is much more easily accounted for in three-dimensional time. So we're going to let the, the, the horizontal be, we're going to call that period. And period is the ordinary sense of time that we've been using forever. And that is, uh, this is in the direction of future. And this over here is in the direction of past. So you can think of that as positive period, negative period, or this is the past, moving into the future. So it's sort of linear time along the horizontal. Um, something we're a little less familiar with, but becoming more familiar with, is what I'm just going to call passage. Well, it's really the rate of passage of time. And so, for instance, we could, you know, we're used to, you know, these are different time periods, like this is yesterday, tomorrow, the next day, you know, on into the future, that's last week, you know, week four, last year, you know, in the past. So the rate of passage of time increases as we go up. So obviously, you know, if you're at this time period with zero passage rate of time, that means you're, you're like stuck in time right here. You're not going anywhere, okay? So that's passage of time. So this could be like negative passage of time, so that would be like moving in reverse. So if you were down here, you'd be moving reverse, which would be forward into the past. Okay. And then this is a very abstract concept, but this is present time. And so what these different, these are all different presents. This is a whole, this is the different present. So an example is, we can have multiple periods of time. So let's go ahead and draw a bunch of different periods. So here we have a couple different periods of time. One period of time, another period of time. And you can't really see, but they're all, all these periods of time are operating at the same passage time, okay? Kind of hard to tell because of me drawing on the chalkboard. But we could raise and low, lower, but so, so this is like maybe this period of time is some guy down in Mexico. And this period of time is some guy in Canada. And this period of time is some guy on the moon. And this period of time is uh, me right here. Well, as you can see, 
we could call this period, oh, say it's uh, July 2nd, 2011. And as you can see, that period runs through these, pre this period has these presents. So to the pre you know, so the guy, Mexico, in his present time, it's consecutive with July 2nd in a linear fashion if they all share the same passage of time. However, we can do all kinds of very interesting things in this three-dimensional time. We've got two guys starting at the same period. Well, they're in different periods of time relative to them each to themselves. They're starting at the same moment, I guess we'll call this. They're all at the same moment. But these guys are at that moment at different periods because they're experiencing time in different passages. So basically, I just wanted to do an informal introduction of the existence equations being applied to quantum mechanics to bring about this issue called identity crisis, how that can be used to describe more or less the inner workings of the collapse of the probability amplitude, which then lead us to concept of three-dimensional time then here's a little bit of an example of using 3D time to show just not only how easy it is, but ultimately how how, a, how much of a beneficial idea this is to clarifying very complicated concepts. So, okay. How was that one? That was good. Yeah? Did it make sense? Or